Schools Board of Education regular board meeting on November 2nd, 2020 in our virtual space that we have. Um, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And roll call, please, John. William Pangle. Here. Amy Bond. Here. Courtney Stegman. Brendan McQueen. John Mazurkovich. Here. Sheila Murphy. Here. Tim Odekirk. Here. Thank you, John. Is there anything on this evening's agenda for any modifications? I have not heard anything from any board members, but I'm looking to see if there is anything. Has there anyone have anything to modify? Not hearing of anything, we will go on to the consent agenda. So under the consent agenda, we have one item this evening. It's the approval of the October 19, 2020 regular board meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve that item under the consent agenda? So moved. Go ahead. So moved, Sheila. Second, Amy. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further questions? Roll call vote, please, John. William Pangle? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. John Mazurkovich? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Kim Odeker? Yes. Motion and is approved. Next item on the agenda is new business. Under new business, we have the first item, a new hire with an administrator. Um, Jen, I'll pass this to you. Thanks, and actually I'm going to pass it right on to Linda for the information this evening. Good evening. Tonight we are very pleased to bring on board Aaron King as our new principal at Mary McGuire Elementary. Aaron started teaching in 2004, so she has over 17 years of experience. And during that time in Vesterberg, she actually did fulfill the role of principal um, and also wore the hat of special, direct, special education director that year. She came into Mount Pleasant in 2011 and joined Pullen Elementary, and she's been a leader with us ever since. Erin um, was interviewed by the ent entire elementary principal team, along with Melissa Isaac, and we're just really excited to bring Erin on board as our new principal at Mary McGuire. We know that um, Ms. Renaud has very hard shoes to fill, but we know that Erin has a passion for for our students and we're really excited to bring her on the administrative team. I can see Erin is a panelist, so congratulations to Erin and we hope the board will approve her appointment. Thank you very much, Linda. Is there any questions for Linda? I, I do and it might be just um, because I haven't thought through a hire before. Uh, and so I apologize if my questions uh, are things that I should know. Um, but I, I wondered uh, how these things work. If were there multiple applicants? I know in our package what we got was your recommendation and Erin's CV. But I wasn't sure if this like how if you could if you wouldn't mind describing the process for me, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Sure. We um, we always post our openings almost always internally and externally at the same time. And um, typically our elementary principal team has worked very closely together. We participate in interviews, even for teachers as a elementary um, leadership team. In this case, we had three internal applicants that we um, thought very highly of. In fact, we, you know, some days interviews can be very draining and we all felt very energized after our day of inter interviews because we had three internal candidates that are all um, Mount Pleasant teachers who have kind of been their administrators, right-hand man, right-hand woman, so to speak, um, taking on those leadership roles. And so um, we were just really thrilled that all three individuals were very capable, um, but we did reach consensus that, that we felt Aunt Aaron was the best candidate for this position. So um, sometimes it's unique that we don't follow through with external candidates, but we were so pleased with our internal candidates this time that we did not interview external candidates. And we did have a handful um, 
of applicants on our online application system that expressed interest. Does that help? It does. Thank okay. you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Linda? Is there a motion to accept the recommendation of hiring Ms. Erin King as the next principal for Mary McGuire? So moved. So moved. Second. So John moved, Amy second. Are there any further questions regarding the motion? John, roll call, please. William Pinkle. Yes. Amy Bond. Yes. John Mazurkovich, yes. Sheila Murphy. Yes. Yeah. Motorkirk. Yes. Motion was unanimous and passed. Congratulations, Erin, and welcome to the team. Or welcome to the administrative team. And um, thank you for stepping up. We appreciate that. The next item on the agenda under new business is another new hire. It's certified staff. So Linda, we'll go right to you. Yes, we are excited to welcome Robert Lewis Veda to our musical department. Um, Robert is joining us. Um, he's been teaching in Farmington Hills. And of all things, he's been doing virtual K-1 music. But um, Mr. Veda is very talented, and we have hired him to take the role of our strings instructor um, that Mrs. Ellenwood recently vacated. So Mr. Tayton and I, along with um, Mr. Winkler and uh, Mrs. Weaver, we've been doing lots of virtual interviews for our musical openings. And so um, we're excited to have Mr. Veda start Try Two to, to teach our orchestra and strings at the middle school and high school level. Are there any questions for Mr. Veda? Well, I had similar questions, um, and so you answered some of them, Linda, that you said there was a, a large pool. Um, it, on my end, I'm not sure if I missed it, but I didn't see um, anything, like there was no CV or anything. Uh, I'm not sure if that's, that's usually kind of what happens where we follow your, you know, the recommendation of the committee. Um, yeah, we I know we can certainly supply you with their with their resume and curriculum vitae if you'd like, but that's we usually do that for our administrators for certainly. Um, but similar process um, since this was secondary music, Mr. Tayton kind of led the way with who was the best fit for what we need in the musical world and kind of defer to his uh, his knowledge of that. Um, but we had the administrators involved in that as well. And in fact, Mr. Clack being so actively involved in the high school musical, he joined us for our interviews as well. Thank you, Linda, that does help. Sure. Any further questions for Linda? Is there a motion to accept the recommendation of hiring Mr. Veda as the next to start high school and middle school? So moved. Second, Sheila. So we have a motion and a second. Motion was John, second was Sheila. Are there any further questions regarding the motion? Roll call vote, John. William Pingle. Yes. Amy Bond. Yes. John Mazurkovich. Yes. Sheila Murphy. Yes. Yes. And we know that you know, that approved and welcome to the district, Mr. Veda. We appreciate you stepping in when you are. Excellent. The next item on the agenda is the student discipline recommendation for student S1 2020-21. Um, Jennifer? Yeah, yeah, I'll handle that this evening. So um, you have in your board packet this evening a, a memo from me um, with a recommendation regarding student discipline. Um, and this is a bit different than what we would typically do. So I'll take a minute just to go through that process. Um, Typically, we have a student whose disciplinary situation rises to the level that they come before the board. Um, we would have a closed session with the board um, and do a hearing, and then the board would recommend, make a recommendation. In very general terms, if a student is suspended at the building level, the building principal has the authority to suspend a student for up to 10 days. That, then, that process then comes to me, where I have the authority to extend that suspension for up to 45 days, but anything beyond that does require board action. Um, after the student has served their term of suspension or expulsion, we have per our policy, 
a student reinstatement committee. And that's a committee that's been in our policy for several years, but you all remember we just started doing this process again about two years ago, where we have a committee that's made up of board members, myself, building administrators and teachers that meet with the student and typically a parent or guardian. And then we go through um, the, the readmission process with the, with the family. After that meeting, we would make a recommendation for approval to the board. This case is a little bit unique. So this is a, a, a first disciplinary situation. This is not a reinstatement situation, but because of the unique nature of our board meetings right now, with everything being virtual, and then also the age of the student, um, we felt like our readmission, our reinstatement committee could hear the disciplinary concerns and then make a recommendation to the board. So we are sort of doing this process in reverse, although you'll see in our summary, we're not actually recommending um, additional disciplinary measures for this student. What we're recommending is that this student may have a change in educational placement. So we're recommending the student was a face-to-face -face student. We're recommending that the student transfer to the Oilers Online program through the second trimester. During that time, we're recommending that the family and the student engage in counseling, work again with um, wraparound services through uh, community mental health, and get the support that they need so that we can then meet with the family again and have reassurance that the student will be safe returning to school. So what we're asking that you do this evening is approve our recommendation for a change in educational placement so the student would not have an extended suspension or expulsion. They would have a change in placement to a virtual program and then we'd be able to revisit this decision um, around the end of the second trimester, which is roughly the beginning of March. So it's a little bit different process than what we've done previously, but we felt like based on the unique situation of our virtual board meetings and the unique situation that the student presented, um, this was the best way to handle the situation. So you'll notice in the memo and everything that we do publicly, we're very careful to not identify the student. We certainly want the student to have that protection and that confidentiality. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, Sheila Murphy and Amy Bond are our two board representatives on the Student Reinstatement Committee with me. So they were part of this process along with the building administrator. Are there any clarifying questions? Jane, this, this, this student's been suspended up till now since the 15th of September. So you've met your 45 days? Um, it's it's not yet been 45 school days. Um, so um, although she's been out of school, she has been working in the virtual programs since then. So we've continued to provide um, educational services for her. If you remember, um, when a student is suspended or expelled, our obligation to continue to provide services is only really maintained for special education students, which this student is not. Um, but we wanted to make sure to maintain something. So. I don't know um, how much work has actually been completed, but she has been provided work by the school. She has technology and devices and that sort of thing. So we will continue to support the student in that manner. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I may have another question, hold on. Sure. <laughs> so am I understanding this right? So. In a normal setting, we would have seen this student in front of the board in a normal. Right, right. I would have. Um, so actually, um, it, prior to our, if you remember at our last board meeting when things were sort of in limbo with the Open Meetings Act, mm -hmm. and we didn't know if we were going to have to meet in person or virtually, my plan actually at that point was to have her come to a board hearing um, okay. face to face when I thought we were meeting face to face. But then at the 11th hour, the governor signed uh, the bill that allowed us to have virtual meetings, which I think we all agreed is more community friendly at this point. And so we shifted to do the student reinstatement committee at that point um, because we couldn't do a face-to-face a -face meeting with the whole board. Yep, understood. I think I'm good, thank you. Okay. And I don't know, Sheila or Amy, if either of you have anything to add about our process or...
No, and I think in this situation that we're not asking for, you know, uh, an expulsion or a suspension, but just a change that it, and honestly, this particular student would not have done well in a Zoom meeting um, situation. And um, like I said, if we were asking you to suspend or anything like that, I think it might be questionable, but we're not coming to you with anything that serious, just to change from face-to-face to, -face to uh, online. And so since there was no board meeting for the students, was she still um, had the ability to be heard uh, and speak So I, with Amy and I missed the second person, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. It was Amy and Sheila, myself, and the building administrator. So um, we did give her lots of opportunity to be heard. Uh, we met with the student and with her parent. Um, so th that that did happen. Um, and, and really, again, this isn't a disciplinary, although it started as disciplinary, but it's a change in educational placement. Um, so we did, I, I believe we gave her ample opportunity to be heard. I don't know, Amy or Sheila, if you want to, to speak to that. I believe we did. We were we met with her for almost an hour, um, and it was a lot of communication. Thank you. Any further questions? Is there a motion to accept the recommendation of taking student number S1 2020-2021 and um, enrolling them in the Euler online program as recommended in the document before us? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Sheila. Are there any questions regarding the motion? Roll call, please, John. William Pengel? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. Yes. John Mazurkovich? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Kim Oderker? Yes. Motion and recommendation approved. And uh, I'm sure Jen will be able to satisfy and contact the parents and get things rolling there. Yes. Thank you very much to Amy and to Sheila for being on that committee and adapting to our circumstances and providing that support. The next item on the agenda is a re the re resolution regarding the changes to the Meetings Act. Um, uh, as you may remember, um, at our last board meeting, everything was changing rapidly, and the legal counsels from Troon had generated a policy to align to the new state law um, that came into act to, um, just before the board meeting. Um, sorry, my computer's running slow. And then recommended here under Jen is the actual language of that modification to our current Open Meetings Act policies within the school board. Um, um, everyone has an opportunity to treat that. Um, Jen, do you have anything more specific to add? Uh, I do not. Um, I, I think that this has just been a recommendation from Troon and from Miola that we adopt this resolution regarding the Open Meetings Act um, that will cover us moving forward. Again, this is a reflection of the state law that was passed um, last week, two weeks ago, um, that we talked about at our last school board meeting. Um, we are not doing a reading of this. This is a request, a recommendation to approve this um, for the, um, at this meeting. Um, it was, information was provided at this meeting. Um, are there any questions regarding this? Um, policy modification that is reflected in the new state law regarding the open meeting. Act. Not hearing anything. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Finally, finally moved and John seconded. Are there any questions regarding the, uh, the motion? Not hearing any. John, roll call, please. William Pinkle? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. John Mazurkovich? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Kim Odeker? Yes. Motion is approved. The next item under new business is donations. And Jen, we will let you talk to our SAG chip 
We were really, really nice donation. The employees of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe got together and um, donated money uh, to give to a charity of their choice. And this donation is coming to the Mount Pleasant Public Schools to help pay off um, lunch debt for our students. So it's a donation of $280. We're asking that you accept the uh, donation this evening with, with our appreciation for their generosity. That is very generous of the employees of the SAG Chip tribe. Are there any questions re regarding this, Jen? Not hearing anything. Is there a motion to uh, accept this donation of $280 from the employees of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe? So moved, Sheila. Second. Second. I heard uh, Sheila. I heard uh, Sheila moved, and I heard that Wyland seconded. Is that correct? Are is there any questions regarding this motion? Roll call vote. William Klingel. Yes. Amy Bond. Yes. John Mazurkovich. Yes. Sheila Murphy. Yes. Tim Motorkirk. Yes, motion is unanimously approved. And again, with great appreciation. That's awesome. That's a great place to put some of those monies. The next slide on the agenda is reports and updates. And we have one of our annual reports in this evening. It is maintenance and Mr. Josh Rhodes. Josh, if you don't mind, I will go ahead. Do you want me to share my screen and pull up your? Yep. Um, okay. Yep. That sounds good. I will do that. Okay, can everybody see it? Oh. Okay, so um, some of you guys have heard this in the past, but some of you haven't, so I'll just, I'll kind of touch base on it again, and, um, and we'll go from there. So this is my facility update for 2021. At first, I'll touch on ca our capital resources, and that is we have over 850,000 square feet of building space, um, kind of to put into, Put that into perspective, we have over 20 acres of buildings. Um, that's broken down into 13 facilities and actual groundage, we have almost 350 acres. I'll just wait till you do your thing. Uh, as far as staff in the maintenance department, we have five full-time staff. Um, we have Marge Seeley, who's maintenance too and has been in the district 32 years. Jerry Travis, who's the licensed electrician and has been with the district 19 years. Ross Davis, who is a licensed HVAC specialist and he's been with the district 14 years. Brian Bowman is a licensed plumber. He has been with the district seven years. Myself as director of facilities and I've been here three years now. Um, I have an administrative assistant. Her name's Carol Long and she's been with us for 42 years. Next is just a breakdown on the square footage of our buildings. Um, you guys have all been emailed this PowerPoint, so if you're, you know, if you're curious, that's just kind of how we're broken down. So I won't read all the different numbers, but um, to put that into perspective, each of our staff are basically, in a nutshell, responsible for maintaining 215,000 square feet of building space. The state of Michigan use, uses a 2,000 square foot home as their benchmark for ma for maintenance personnel. Um, so each of our staff is responsible for maintaining 108 homes, um, which can be pretty daunting and pretty incredible at the same, you know, at the same point. Um, how do we communicate what needs fixed throughout the district? Uh, we use School Dude Maintenance Direct. This is management software for K through 12 facilities. This is in a sense a once broken fix it approach. Um, this is, you know, any, you know, any teacher saying, hey, you know, the heat isn't working in my classroom. Any district employee has the ability to enter a work request that will cycle through, comes directly to Carol. Carol will process them, dish them out to the guys. Um, if it's, you know, if it's complicated or a little different, she'll, you know, she'll get me involved. Um, but everyone has the ability to do it. And it kind of gives, it keeps track of it, gives us numbers. Um, helps keep me let me keep track of warranty information you know if it's like if it's something that comes through again 
Um, I've kind of given a bro I break down every year on kind of what the majority of ours are. This year, plumbing and roofing have been kind of leading leading the forefront with heating and cooling, electrical, um, doors and hardware, moving. Um, since I've been here, we've been in construction every summer, and now COVID kind of shuffling furniture, so moving's always been a big one. Um, and then athletics and miscellaneous after that. This is a breakdown on how many work orders we process in a given year. Um, that number, you can see the spike there. That, that's pretty much related a lot to bond work. Bond work and construction creates a lot of work for us, um, a lot of extra work. So you can see that number just between moving and um, you know fixing and just tidying up and just everything. The number's kind of you know getting up there. We're on pace to be at that same point um, this year. But ideally, I'd like to see this number go down. <laughs> in the future, but that's, that's always the goal. Uh, as of last year, we started using school dude preventative maintenance or PM direct. Um, this is more, this is a better approach in my mind. It's, it's maintain it, you know, do a better job maintaining to increase the longevity of everything. Um, so that you don't get those other work orders of the, you know, the catastrophic break, broke down, you know, we don't have heat here, we have leaks there. Um, it's kind of a more pro more proactive approach. Facility scheduling. Um, as far as all of our events, that's a screenshot of just a random a random month. Obviously, you can see October of nineteen. But we use School Dude FS Direct. Every employee has the ability to enter requests for events. They then go to me. Um, they have, you know, they can check boxes on, you know, if they need doors open, heating on, you know, after hours, lighting on, um, and then it will automatically alert either technology about the doors or myself about, you know, any facility needs. Um, I approve all of those and Jen kind of gets a copy blasted to her email as well. Facility rentals, um, not relevant this year due to COVID. Um, Jen and I still get it. A lot of people inquiring, wanting to use our spaces, and we, I mean, obviously we feel bad, um, you know, that it's kind of, this everything's been crazy this year, but we developed that, that rental agreement. It has our board policies attached to it. It has kind of all of our rules and guidelines, our fees kind of um, in there so people know what to expect. Um, we don't really charge for like a profit, but we do, you know, charge to like, you know, to keep the lights on and to heat the spaces and stuff, kind of at least a break-even approach. Um, so there's, so that's there. And if, so if anyone ever approaches any of you guys and wants to use the space or anything, just have them get a hold of me and I can get them the information once this is done. <laughs> so contracted services. So our custodial service, um, who you, who we've heard a lot about this past year, um, is Grand Rapids building supply or, uh, Grand Rapids building services. They've been with us since 2010. Uh, their district supervisor is Jessica Bowen. They have 10 day staff, which these numbers have went up because we hired, we hired more people for, you know, the four hour disinfecting and the nighttime electrostatic spraying. Um, but typically we have 10 day staff and their daytime supervisor is Claude Lammer or Spike. We normally have 24 night staff. Now we have 27. Um, and their supervisor is Chris Orwine. And I'd just like to give them a shout out for all of the disinfecting they've been doing. They've kind of, they've been, it's been a tough year for them. But. Also under contracted services is Green Scene Landscaping. Uh, they've been with us since 2014, still currently under contract. They are responsible for the mowing, edging, spraying for weeds, um, trimming of shrubs. Green Scene donates a good amount back to us every year, whether that be in labor or plants, mulch, etc. cetera. Um, this year they donated a good amount of mulch. They actually did what I'll talk about here in a couple slides. Uh, the Stadium Hill donated a lot of mulch there too. So, also under contracted services is Commercial Control Solutions. This is hardware and software for on-site and remote monitoring for all of our HVAC systems. So, we'll dive into a little bit of the HVAC-related stuff here in a little bit. But this is this is what this just gives an example of one media center of an air handler I see all the readings we take. So. A lot of the, you know, a lot of, a lot of issues 
I guess, say, people, you know, oh, my room is cold. A lot of these I can pull right up on a computer, kind of get a general diagnostic of it without even sending someone to the field. A lot of times it can be like, all right, everything's working. I'll bump you up a degree or two. Everyone's happy. No one had to go there. There wasn't a bunch of, you know, not. It's kind of made their process a lot more efficient. Um, every classroom, I can pull this, basically this drawing, give or take, you know, which heating system it has. I can pull it up for pretty much every room in our district. So on to the summer construction. This is Mary McGuire. We did new terrazzo, carpet, and LVT at Mary McGuire. Here's kind of just a shot I took of the hallways, the before and after of the terrazzo, all waxed. And it looks pretty good. It looks a lot nicer than the dingy carpet we had before. Also, a big topic throughout the community was the Stadium Hill renovation. Um, got a lot of compliments on that, whether it be parents at football games or just the general appeal of it. But there's a before, uh, in the process of, in and after of that. Also, the new carpet and LVT at Kenny. We got rid of some, some old busted up benches and um, special ed. Stephanie and Kelly kind of painted that wall up and we put some tack boards up there, changed some carpet, and it's also looking sharper. Same scenario at Vowels. Vowels had the terrazzo done last year. This year was time for carpet and LBT. So that building was, was gutted this year as well. Toilet partitions at the high school and the middle school. Um, something I'm really happy about because I've <laughs> bathrooms always just seem to get beat up. And uh, so you can see the new, new concrete partitions. They look a lot better. This bathroom was actually the middle school. We opted to actually redo the ceiling. They had old blue, painted blue tiles in it, some old lighting. Um, so we kind of brightened it up and it should hopefully last forever and look sharp in the process. One of our, one of my projects. So this was, the barn was built in 16 and that first year of construction, it just got stuffed and packed full um, between all the buildings we gutted and everything. When I hired in, it, it looked like that, and it, we couldn't get time to do it. And um, in light of all, all the shipments we got this year, it's been a pretty wild year. We, between all the COVID PPE supplies, we had tons of money and grants for paper. Everything you see, all those skids, that's all copy paper. Um, that's, an, that's a 40 by 60 barn, too, so there is a lot of paper there. And we have a, a shop full of it as well. So um, I, I'm pretty pumped to get that, get that organized. So. Another project that was this summer, we, we, we had our stage redone. Um, replaced a bunch of broken up and chipped boards, had it sanded down, that's a process after it was sanded, and the end picture, and it, it looks a lot sharper. In one of our more recent projects, I know Tim touched on this in, in the last board meeting, but um, we worked with Trees Now Isabella in Relief, Michigan. And between MDOT and DTE, they kind of took down a couple old pine trees for that right lane expansion on 20. And I gave them the approval under the assumption they would give us some trees in return. I did not expect them to give us what they gave us, which is awesome, but they donated $4,500 in trees. We had over 15 groups and over 50 volunteers who showed up and participated. They might recognize their pictures, but that's Tim on the right and Jen in the middle there. But And we topped off all of our playgrounds with mulch, so the kids have a nice, clean, fresh place to play. Um, our current focuses. So this is kind of the same every year um, with my, my report being this time of the year. Um, we are always focusing on preventative maintenance and just making sure all of our heat systems are ready for winter um, because it can be pretty brutal. So we try staying ahead of those, whether it's greasing pumps, um, just, yeah, all of our inspections are going through right now. Winterizing outdoor plumbing. Our mechanics actually serviced our, our large plow trucks and um, serviced all of our tractors. So we're, we're just getting ready for winter. So in out, out of the last couple board meetings, there's been some talk on airflow. So I was going to touch base on that. A kind of a predictor of good indoor air quality that a lot of people are using right now, just in the midst of this pandemic, um, because there's a lot of variables with 
our HVAC systems and we'll, you know, we'll get a discussion going on this. But CO2 levels, they're measured in parts per million. A lot of people are using this number as a predictor for indoor air quality. The standard preferred range um, from ASHRAE or OSHA is to be below 1,000. If it's below 1,000, it's considered good indoor air quality. Um, typical outdoor, outdoor ranges, just complete fresh air, can range from 350 to 450. In our area, it seems like they're four to five hundreds. But in like metropolitan areas, the outdoor air can be anywhere from six to 900 parts per million. The lower the number, the better. Um, prior to us even starting the school year, we maximized as many fresh air intakes as we could to kind of combat this. Um, we knew it would help. So I have since bought a meter and I've, I've surveyed four buildings. They're all on here as of now. I'm going to continue to survey them, but I've been taking the principal around me just because for us to get readings, it has to be business as usual, um, a classroom full of kids, their masks on, just to get an accurate reading. It can't be an empty classroom. They've, you know, they had to be in that class for an hour just so it's kind of just a typical classroom. Um, all of these were surveyed with the windows closed. I do feel, just because it was the temperatures in the first one I did, it was raining, but this is gonna be a more accurate predictor of what we're heading into. Winter, we can't have the windows open. I mean, so this is going to be a more, more accurate predictor this way. So I've surveyed four buildings so far. I'm going to continue to do more and I will get you guys that information as we do it. Um, but I've surveyed, so I can run through it real quick. Fancher, the building average was 682. I, the highest reading I had in the building was 792 and the low was 590. That's, and there's outdoor air the outdoor air, what it was reading at the time, standing in the middle of the yard by myself. Rosebush, I did the same thing. You can see the building average was 595. The highest room I had was 780. Ganyard, 691. Highest room I had was 789. Mount Pleasant Middle School, average 711. The highest room I had was 1005. That's the highest reading I've had so far. Um, that's still, yes, it is above 1000, which is kind of the cutoff for good indoor air quality. It was one random room. Um, you can see the average is still pretty decent. So it was kind of an outlier in we, you know, I don't really know why it was in the new wing. So it has the newest ventilation from 2016. So that was, I don't know if they were really worked up or you know what this, what the story was there. Um, but that's all of the buildings I have surveyed so far. And he's so it, one, and I guess to put into perspective, ASHRAE and OSHA like to see below 1,000 for good in indoor air quality. Anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500, technically all you'll see is you'll like drowsiness. So I mean, we're, that's all the way up to 2,500. So yeah, we are a little like five over that threshold, which I, you know, I wasn't happy to see, but there isn't any adverse health, health effects besides not related to the pandemic um, until over 2,500 parts per million in that indoor air space. Well, um, we can touch base on that, but I was just, the next slide was just me saying thanks for everything. I know it's been a long and exhausting year for all of us, but yeah, so we can talk about the, whatever. Do you have any questions? Uh, I want to start by thanking you, Josh, uh, for the extra work that I gave you to go measure all these CO2 levels. No, I really good. appreciate that you, uh, you started the process and I actually was, when we received uh, a partial list of numbers earlier last week, I was really pleased, uh, especially with a building like uh, Fencher that, you know, we all said it's an older building, maybe ventilation is not as good. Uh, having the, even the highest reading be below 800 is a real, um, really shows that whatever you guys are doing is working. I did um, wonder, especially in that middle school, how many classes were, if, if you have the data somewhere, out of curiosity, how many were above 800 uh, in that 800 to 1,000, which is kind of like, ideally, if we listen to the science, in the, well, I fully agree with you that the 1,000 is the official kind of cutoff as for what, you know, kind of qualifies as proper good indoor air quality. Um, the recommended range in the pandemic is below 800. And so as a, as a parent, you know, I would probably want to know, well, you know, how many classrooms is this? Uh, is it just a few where we can literally stick a air filter or air purifier in those couple rooms that have odd readings? Or is that too many for us to be able to do that? 
So I surveyed a few rooms out of every wing because every wing tends to have similar HVAC systems. So for in the building average was 771. So I mean, even with that high number, I would have to say I don't have my map in front of me actually. But even with that high number as that as that outlier for the building average to be 770. And I Matt, the assistant principal, and I surveyed I think at least a dozen rooms. Um, so, I mean, for the 770 to be the average, there had to be a lot significantly lower than that, which is what you and I want to see down around 600. But with that outlier, we know that skewed the thing up, but I can get you that information. I have it all wrote down. Yeah, I'd just be curious to see if it's, you know, and it could be, as you said, just an outlier that day. Um, and um, It was, it was, I don't, I don't think I had another one in the 900s, and, but then there, just, there was that one just high. So, no. but I can get you, I have all that wrote down. Thanks. Any other questions for Josh and his annual report? I do. And Josh, um, yes, sir. Since you came on about three years ago, I remember you coming on, um, and you've been a big advocate of the prevent, ma preventive maintenance approach. And I don't think that you can actually use the, the amount of tickets as, as a bellwether as to whether or not you're seeing the effects that you're looking for in uh, preventive maintenance approach for um, maintaining all of our systems. Um, because, I mean, anybody can open a ticket for virtually anything. I don't think that really tells us. Have you, are you seeing the effects of the preventative maintenance approach that you've implemented uh, in the types of tickets that you're getting? Are you yes. So we're at roughly 900 right now, and we're in a trimester through. So I get, so even in that preventative maintenance platform, I guess, all of my guys get assigned the work through work orders. So that number still goes up. It's just, it's just me dishing them out for preventative and not like catastrophic failures already. So I myself drive that number up through the preventative approach. Also, I mean, just this year, for example, I get, I get a dozen work orders a, a week probably saying, hey, we need more masks. Hey, we need more sanitizer. Hey, we need, you know, a couple extra desks. We have some students coming back. So I'm, COVID has bumped that number up because I'm constantly dishing out PPE right now. And that's how everyone's letting me know. Cause they're you through our new, we have like a custodial work request link through that new link. That's how they're relaying that to me. And it relays it to me and to spike um, the custodial that way, if I'm tied up and he's making his rounds anyways, he can get him the PPE that way. There's just, it's, you know, it's smooth and it's quick. So we are essentially pumping that number up. Um, but yes, I do. I do believe in the amount of catastrophic failures. I do think that I do believe it's going down. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't think that you could really use that as a bellwether as the types of tickets. So uh, I appreciate yeah. the explanation. Yep. Josh, I have one comment. I'd like to thank you for the football stadium. I can't the generations of children who've rolled down that back hill yeah. and broken arms and so many injuries at games and soccer games and, and that darn back hill. I'm very happy that that has come to an end. So I helped with it, but Jen was the big advocate. You, Jen? That. Yeah, that's her. Yeah. She's been dealing with that for years, I think. That's just the, the significant safety issue that hill has been for decades and decades is just been something so I'm, I'm very excited that that has been corrected i'm also it very excited beautiful. about the, um, the flooring and all the buildings and the long-term benefit for the district of the investment of the terrazzo floors mm. um you know that and the cleanliness of the terrazzo floors and the ability to clean it and take them and the carpeting costs i mean that alone and so i want to thank the community for stepping up in our bond to being allowing us to make our buildings cleaner and long-term invested pro uh, uh, maintenance cost mm -hmm. savings is is phenomenal so they look um, good forever they don't hold in dust i mean they're just they're more of a hypoallergenic approach so they're the way yeah. to go all the way around so yeah so th that was a great investment for the district and i want to thank the community for stepping up and doing that and i also want to thank your team because it is hard taking care of all of that space and all of those needs and um you know um Another thing I've, I've noticed, I was thinking about when you were doing your presentation, I can't tell you the number of years when we had this conversation and the teachers who complain that the rooms are either too cold, too hot, too hot, too cold, too cold, too hot. That was a, probably one of the number one complaints you would get on a regular basis. And I really don't get those complaints anymore. So 
personally, thank you. Um, because You're I can't welcome. crawl and keep them warm or keep them cool. Um, but um, it is interesting what technology and new systems can do to make the environment stable so our children can learn and our teachers can teach. A, a, that is a significant impact on academics. So it's oh, yeah. your, your connection to the, what your team does does impact academics and what our children are learning. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions for Josh? I, I do have another one. Um, and this is one that I'm relaying from parents. I've been hearing over the last few weeks. Uh, what does that mean when we hear the area is deep cleaned? And so let's say this, uh, let's take the, you know, the scenario. So we have the red team at the middle school that's quarantining and we hear it's going to get deep clean. Is it just the red team area that's getting the deep clean? Uh, is it the whole building? Like how, how does that process work and how do we know that um, it's getting accomplished, I guess, if you don't mind walking us through? No. So Jen and I err on the side of caution and whenever there's been a probable case, we've like, so when she says deep clean, that's basically we are electro electrostatically disinfecting everything. So that's the, that's the sprayer that gets the top of the surfaces, the bottom of the surfaces. You just go in and hose the room down. Um, people who have seen it are literally like, kind of walk the other direction. They're like, oh, that thing's kind of scary. It looks like you're going in there with a fogger. Um, it's the best disinfecting protocol there is to date. So when she says deep cleaned, that's what she means. So, and like I said, we, I mean, the kids are everywhere. Even if they're in cohorts, I mean, they, they bounce around, whether the cafeteria, I mean, you know, they just, they got to walk to the class. So we've been disinfecting the entire building every time there has been a probable case. We have a schedule right now. So every building is basically getting blasted with those things every other day as it is. So it's, we're kind of going crazy with the disinfecting. Um, yeah, it's, well, I'm going, going through the expensive Clorox 360 juice, like it's, going on you know it's going out of style but yeah Does that answer you, your that question helps. no and i think it answers i think some of the parents that were talking to me with like for example you know thinking maybe there was some vacuuming going on and when you don't see the floor vacuumed any differently no. than the day before no. you so, so yeah deep cleaning and disinfecting are two totally different things because yes. yeah you can see paper on the floors or like you know something you know some ink on the desks. That doesn't mean it wasn't sprayed with these machines. There's a lot of literature. If you get, if anyone watching wants to Google Clorox 360 or YouTube it, there's a good light, a light bulb demo that they, they go, they spray with a bunch of other disinfectant machines and then they spray with that. And it kind of shows how it all works and how it gathers around all surfaces. Um, but there's a lot of knowledge out there, a lot of, a lot of literature out there. You can, it's, it's the best technology for disinfecting we have through the cares act funding and stuff i bought one of those machines for every building so yeah, i mean we're you know we're doing great and uh, like i said once we're through this i think our flu seasons are going to be the best they've ever been from this point forward because they were significant to buy um but i think we're, we're set up as far as that goes for years to come but thank you josh yeah you're welcome I'll just add to that too, Wileen, um, with the way the timing works of learning of probable cases, um, it's often been a couple of days. And so I think that's, that's why our schedule of regular disinfecting of all of our buildings is so important. Um, for example, last week with the situation that we had, um, when I learned about it, we were able to track back and say, okay, that building was uh, disinfected right that day right after even though we didn't know about the situation for two days later two days later so when i send out those letters to families i just want to reassure everyone that you know we are disinfecting we are continuing to deep clean um, because i think it's important that they remember that those protocols are in place but we're often able to catch up if you will before we even know there's a situation just the way that the timing works so uh, they have a great schedule in place that i think is working really well and I uh, really appreciate the clarification. And I think obviously it's working because we haven't had a um, evidence at least that they're spread within the school so far, despite that the increase in number of cases. Uh, and so definitely kudos to whatever your team is doing because something's, something's working. Um, yeah, yeah. Like Jen said, by the time she finds out, it's already been a couple days. And like she said last week, by the time she's like, hey, we have a probable, probable case here, I'm like, that building's been disinfected three times since that person was at work already. So it's just, I mean, we're, yeah, we're just erring on the side of caution and just kind of going crazy, so. 
Thank you, Jack. If you have any questions, Appreciate shoot me an email or get a hold of Jen and I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. The next item on the agenda is the Mount Pleasant Community Education Update from Miss Kim Funnel. Hi, Kim. Would you like me to do your PowerPoint as well? Yes, please. Thank you, Jen. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, this presentation is about a year overdue. Um, can, you, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yes. I put my earbuds in because I wanted to make sure that you could hear me, hear me fine. Um, but the staff and um, myself from Community Ed really wanted to take an opportunity to present this evening. Um, it was on my mind to take time last year to present and, and things did not lend itself um, to be able to do that. So I'm happy to present this evening um, to showcase the adult and community education programs that we have to offer our Mount Pleasant community this, um, this year. So my first slide just wanted to highlight the different programs under the umbrella of Mount Pleasant community education. And so we have several different programs offered at different locations. Um, and it, honestly, uh, this is my third full year as director of these programs. And my first year and a half, it, it really was a challenge for me to keep them all separate. So um, no doubt our community um, is a little, little curious as well. So we have for, for you this evening, um, our Oasis building houses a couple different programs. Um, our Mount Pleasant Adult and Community Education, uh, we call that our main campus. Um, a little later on this evening, you'll hear from our Way uh, High School and Middle School alternative programs, um, which are also housed at that Oasis building. Um, under the umbrella of Mount Pleasant Community Education, we also have a classroom at the Isabella County Correctional Facility um, in downtown, downtown Mount Pleasant. Uh, our teachers do provide instruction at our main campus and at the correctional facility every single day. We also provide services for students and youth who are adjudicated um, and attend school at Isabella County Day Treatment Facility. So that is just on the other side of our parking lot um, in previous years, in previous years, sorry, I got a text on my phone. It drew my attention away. Um, our teachers would rotate between our main campus, Isabella Day County uh, Treatment Facility, and then downtown. This year, due to some staffing um, reconfigurations, we have one staff member, one teacher, uh, Mike Ritt, who serves as the uh, teacher of record for Isabella County Day Treatment Facility. And then we have two teachers who provide services at our main campus and um, downtown. And also we have under the community education umbrella, our Great Starts Readiness Program. Uh, last year, we were very fortunate to receive additional slots, which allowed us to open a second classroom. Um, so we now have two GSRP classrooms um, uh, within Mount Pleasant Public School Districts. And I'm super excited about the second classroom that we added um, because we are offering an opportunity for early childhood special education students to have a full day um, preschool opportunity with general education students. So that inclusivity of providing um, an educational opportunity for um, those with, with special needs to learn from other students and from our general population to learn from students with special needs. So it's been a, a great addition to our, our programs. Tonight's presentation is primarily going to highlight our um, adult and community education offerings. And so this slide just allows me to introduce our staff um, we have Anna Gilbert. She is our English language arts teacher. Patricia Heitman is our mathematics guru, our expert. Um, she is 
amazing and reaching students who have the perception that they do not like like math and they're not good with math. Pat has ways about her that she changes that perception with the students she works with. Mike Ritt is our science teacher and as I mentioned he does um, provide instruction solely at day treatment facility. Ray Wilton. Um, Ray Wilton has been with Mount Pleasant Community Education for decades. Um, we like to say that Ray has been in jail or uh, for, for, for decades. So he is our social studies teacher and our classroom supervisor um, and our partner, our liaison with our jail um, as our jail supervisor. Stacy Zion, um, again, has worked with Mount Pleasant Community Education for close to 20 years, and she serves as our student services supervisor and career and college navigator. So she helps bridge those transitions for students after they receive their high school uh, diploma and GED. Um, she helps them to answer what's next in their lives. Kristen Cardinal, um, Caitlin Jones are our two GSRP teachers. Lynn Cotter and Aaron Bars are our GSRP associate teachers who work collaboratively with our teachers. And um, I'm Kim Funnel, the director of these wonderful programs. Um, the offerings that we have for our community at our adult and community education program, we help to provide adults um, with basic education skills. So as people enroll in our programs, um, part of our program is to pro provide an assessment or have, st have students um, give us uh, their best effort in, in showing us their strengths and their skills. Um, that assessment is called the, the test of adult basic education skills. So anyone who tests below a ninth grade level, we provide them with basic education um, classes to help build up their skills so that they're more successful in high school um, classes. We do offer high school diploma completion classes and we have preparation courses for um, those individuals who are looking to earn their GED or high school equivalency um, assessment. And then we have individuals who may have um, graduated with a high school diploma, went straight into the workforce right after high school, um, but maybe their job's been eliminated through the years. And now they're faced with the opportunity to go back to school, um, but they might not have the skills necessary to enroll um, at a, at a two-year or four-year institution. Um, so we are able to work with individuals wanting to increase their uh, adult secondary skills um, in, in an uh, aspiration to go on to college, or maybe they need to um, pass a test, a certain test in their current employer um, to reach the next um, advancement level in their job. So we are able to work with many, many individuals um, through a broad spectrum of, of course offerings. When I became director, um, the first year it was really just kind of navigating the programs, figuring out the staff, understanding the needs of our staff and our students. Um, PBIS uh, has been a big part of Mount Pleasant Public Education. Um, again, um, being able to do positively reinforce behaviors that we expect from our students. And sometimes those expectations need to be taught. Um, and that's no different with adults, uh, the adult learners that we see in our, in our OASIS um, building. So we are able to personalize education. Um, we have individualized in instruction. We hope that we are providing um, safe and engaged learning opportunities that people will, will take advantage of so that one day they will be employable. So our model is that we hope that individuals see their future um, through the course offerings that we have. Um, we also provide special education services for individuals who, who qualify, who are age appropriate. Um, and we steer our, our, um, our students in wraparound community supports um, that are offered uh, to help them uh, bridge those 
barriers and, and gaps that they often see. I do want to highlight um, our partnership and, and our funding resources. Um, so adult education is funded differently than K-12 education. We are, um, our funding comes from the labor and economic opportunity, so LEO. Um, and Mount Pleasant Community Education, we apply for and we receive uh, different funding sources every year. Um, one of those is our state 107 fund, which I'll talk about uh, in the next couple of slides. But we also receive two federal grants. Um, those are called WIOA grants or Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Uh, we receive a grant for general instruction, which can, which can be used at our main campus um, and our downtown uh, campus. And we also receive WIOA institutional funds. Those funds can only be spent on student support services um, at our downtown or our, our jail classroom. Um, the other part of that slide I do want to highlight um, is that we have a strong partnership with our Michigan Works Association. Um, our local association is really right around the corner, just a couple miles from our building. Um, and in normal years, we provide um, twice a month workshops for our, our adult learners. Uh, we offer one at our building and one at Michigan Works so that we can introduce our our um, students to the resources that are available to them. Um, we help them uh, build resumes, we mock interviews, we talk about budgets, um, we help them um, seek out opportunities for postgraduate learning opportunities, whether that they may be um, a two-year college or a four-year college or even a trade skill. Um, Michigan Works, through their funding sources, are able to pay for individuals who might want to go into one of those critical skilled trades um, that are, are needed in our state. So, for example, in, in this past May, we had an individual who received her high school diploma from our program, and within a couple of weeks, through our partnership with Michigan Works, she enrolled in a uh, SENA program, which was completely funded by Michigan Works. So, um, you know, we often say that we, we help change lives in our program, and that is one example of, of doing that. She received her high school diploma, um, received additional uh, job training. Um, we, th th through that effort, um, they paid for her shoes that she might have to wear on the job, her uniforms, a stethoscope, all of those things were funded through the efforts of, of our collaboration and Michigan Works. So we're extremely grateful um, for these two partnerships. This year, due to COVID, we will be offering Michigan Works uh, workshops um, still to our participants, but they will be offered virtually mainly because Michigan Works is not open to the public and we are really re trying to reduce the number of visitors um, that we have in our buildings. Uh, you may or may not have heard about this opportunity. Um, earlier in the year, the, the governor of Michigan, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, did announce the Futures for Frontliners initiative. Uh, this is free tuition for essential workers. This is huge. This is an opportunity provided to adults who may or may not have earned their high school diploma or GED, but were on the front lines in the initial phases of the pandemic. So an individual that was working between April of this year and June 30th qualify. Um, they cannot be a current high school student in a traditional high school. Um, this is focused on our, our adults in our community, in our state, who um, you know, may need some additional supports and encouragement to, to finish high school and then go on to earn uh, an associate degree. So free tuition to local community college um, to pursue an associate degree uh, or skills in a certified job trade area. Um, so there, there is a deadline for individuals to apply, apply for this opportunity. 
and that is um, fast approaching December 31st. Um, we are through our region um, and through our reporting system through the state, uh, we do see individuals who have um, applied for this opportunity. And so we are reaching out to them, um, those that have a zip code of 48858 and making sure that they're aware of Mount Pleasant Community Education and that we're there to help them fulfill their dreams of earning a high school diploma or GED so that they um, too can take advantage of this Futures for Frontliners opportunity. Like I mentioned earlier, um, one of our major uh, largest funding sources for adult community education is through our state 107 funds. In Mount Pleasant, we are in region five. Um, so the state of Michigan um, uh, allocates funds, um, adult education funds um, per region. And so we are in region five, along with Bay Aranac ISD, Claire Pioneer Adult Alternative Education, Midland Education and Training Connection, Fulton and Alternative Ed, Gladwin Education and Training Connection, um, Saginaw Education and Training Connection, and Swan Valley Adult and, and Alternative Education. Um, so the, the clever little uh, advertisement there, dropping out happens, but it's never too late to drop back in, is a regional uh, advertisement um, that you will probably hear about on the radio. You may see some billboards or this might be on some of our ICTC or County Connection buses um, because we do, we do think strategically um, across our region. We want to advertise collaboratively um, as a region we meet on a monthly basis to talk about our program successes, some of our challenges, and really share the best practices that we're seeing the most success um, with our adult students. So we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, a very strong um, region and we look forward to seeing um, how, how our efforts will pay off in the future. I do wanna highlight, um, again, as I'm kind of uh, boasting a little bit about our wonderful staff and the programs that we offer. Um, I thought it was important to kind of show and not just tell you um, the amazing efforts that our staff put in. Um, so these slides, these pictures just kind of highlight the dedication, the passion, the compassion um, that our, our staff has for our students um, through uh, countless hours of going to garage sales or library book sales to um, fill the shelves that you see there in the picture. Um, that is our bookshelves in our downtown classroom um, at our Isabella County Jail. Uh, writing grants to be able to provide resources and materials to um, then be able to do authentic learning activities like the M&M's um, ratio and, and mathematic activity you see in one slide. Uh, another staff member found it to be uh, very much a need as people are put into jail. They go into jail with what they have literally on their backs. So um, often we find individuals that have um, eyesight difficulties and they might need um, readers. So one particular teacher wrote a grant so that we could be able to purchase, um, go to the dollar store and buy a uh, countless number of uh, different vision um, reader glasses. And so you'll see pictures um, showing evidence of that. The individual with the computer and the little sticky notes. Those are, the uh, on the sticky notes are positive um, quotes, um, supportive messages, encouragement words um, to help cheerlead and support our students. Um, again, just to go off some more about our dedicated staff, um, I thought it was important um, to recognize our staff. Um, we did have four individuals who um, their positions were, were reduced and eliminated over the summer. Um, but I thought it was important to highlight um, the number of years of dedication that, that our current staff have. So you see the new hire dates for our, in, our staff that we currently have. 
um, the accumulated number of years, um, 80, and our educational level um, that we have of our staff. Um, so again, this, this slide just highlights um, the, the dedication that, that we do show um, the individuals in our community. This slide just needed a, a, its own slide. Um, last year, Patricia Heitman uh, was recognized um, by her peers and community as an outstanding educator by the McKay um, uh, Board. And so the McKay Organization is a Mis Michigan Association of Community and Adult Education Learners. So Pat was recognized and honored for her um, long-term dedication, her unique efforts in engaging students, and just her overall humanitarian effort that she has provided um, for countless number of years uh, for hundreds of individuals um, in our Mount Pleasant community. So I just wanted to, to give that um, some special recognition. At Mount Pleasant Community Ed, we like to celebrate special events, um, whether it be Halloween. Um, this year was, was a little stale. It's gonna be stale the whole year. We'll find, we'll find opportunities to celebrate for sure. Um, but we, we try to provide opportunities for potlucks or for um, gatherings for our staff, uh, our students. We know many of them do not have those opportunities among their families or friends. Um, and we like to try to replicate um, community and family as much as possible. So this slide just, sh just shares um, a little bit of that. Um, if you've been in our, our building, you'll see um, we do have a potential graduate board. And when he or she is within five or six credits of earning his or her high school diploma, uh, we memorialize that. We, we shout that out and we let that individual write his or her name um, publicly so that all know that they're really close. Um, when that individual has crossed that bridge and earned all of his or her credits, again, we memorialize that and we make a big deal out of that. And that individual gets to write his or her name um, on our list of graduates. Um, so we, we really take pride in helping um, every individual um, we walk with him or her along their, their path um, and help them achieve their goals. Um, the one slide down there with, with Patricia and, and Stacy um, and Deontay is, is from a few years ago. Um, McKay does highlight and, and uh, provide opportunities for us to um, lobby for adult education. Again, um, it's not a part of the K-12 education funding, um, so it is important for us that we let legislators and those that are holding the purse strings um, know that adult education does matter and, and it really does um, change lives in, in our community. So lastly, um, before I take any, any questions, I just wanted to highlight that um, we do have a slightly different enrollment process this year. Um, we have uh, transitioned to an online enrollment application so people can visit our adult education webpage through the Mount Pleasant Public Schools um, and they'll, they'll see a link for the enrollment. Um, we've also streamlined our orientation. We used to offer two times a month face-to-face -face, uh, orientation opportunities. Um, that opportunity is now open all, all year long every single day um, and can be accessed through our webpage. Um, and after that, then the final, final and last and final step is, is academic planning um, with Stacy Zion. So anybody interested can give us a call and we definitely can help them um, enroll and fulfill their dreams of earning high school diploma or GED. So I'm kind of whizzed through that. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions that you may have this evening. Kim, thank you for the presentation. It's really nice to hear all the programs laid out. I remember when I first started attending these board meetings, how confused I was with like all the different programs and having it laid out really, I think uh, would help every, anybody listening. I wondered if you could give us an indication of the size of your 
your four programs, uh, roughly, I don't need exact numbers, but um, if we can get an idea of like how many people are, are attending. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, with our GSRP classrooms, our two preschool classrooms at Rosebush, um, we do elect um, to take 16 full day slots. So we are able to provide a preschool opportunity free of charge for uh, 32 children um, at the, the Rosebush um, Elementary School. Isabella County Day Treatment, we um, are able to service up to 12 youth um, in that program. And our adult and education numbers, um, currently with our jail program and our main campus, we're close to 100 right now. But any given year that, I mean, that, that's where we're at three months into the year. Um, but at the end of the year, we could service up to 200 to 250 individuals. Um, our adult learners seems to be our, our, our most transient and fluent population, fluid population. Um, we may have an individual in our downtown or our jail classroom one day and the next day he or she has been released or transferred or, or what have you. Um, so right now we do have um, a high number of individuals who are participating in our adult program virtually. Um, you can imagine there's all sorts of circumstances with individuals taking care of children um, or maybe have an underlying health condition um, where they do not want to be in, in the public. Um, so we, we all together are, are around 100 students with our adult education program right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I can keep going, okay, I have more questions. But Tim, you can go ahead if you want. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Kim and her team because um, people often forget that we have such a broad stretch in where we offer our education. It's just not in our, what people consider our K-12 space. Um, so one of the questions that I have is, wh at what point are you considered an adult learner over, let's say, a 12th grade or K-12? When what is that age break that put, puts you into that adult learning category? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so we consider an adult learner, a, somebody who is 18 years or older um, as an adult learner. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Willene. Well, you, you mentioned, Kim, that over the summer, and I'm guessing it was due to the budget restrictions and the, the, the planning, that you had either reduced or eliminated some of your staff. And I wondered, uh, with the change of budgets we had recently, if that was something that was able to get reverted or if this is something that hasn't changed. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Wilina, and thank you for, for asking that. Um, so. The short answer is um, no, um, because our funding is way different than K-12 funding. Um, we were, we were, I was applying and we actually started school year without applying for or writing our state 107 budget. And so until um, mid to the end of September, we really weren't even sure what that funding was going to be. Um, so. Unfortunately, um, the K-12 funding um, good news really did not impact our adult education funding. In fact, our two federal grants um, did receive a slight reductions um, and that maintained. Um, and our state 107 budget did receive a reduction, um, mainly because our participation rate has fallen in the last couple of years. And, and so adult funding in our, our region, we, we determine how we fund our programs within our region. Um, and that is based on the number of participants um, and the number of success and then post-program outcomes. So um, our program received a slight reduction um, and in each year, the next two years, we'll continue to see a slight reduction in our 107 fund due to how our program is determining, or excuse me, our region is determining our program allocations. 
Now, we could see an increase in funding if we are able to increase our participation numbers, increase our, 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 um, our outcome numbers, um, but we're being conservative and planning for um, possibly that not happening. That makes sense. And would you say that the, I mean, a question I had before hearing you tonight, uh, independently of the finances was what, um, what would you consider your biggest uh, constraints or limitations? Um, and see, you know, as a new board member, like, you know, kind of what, what can we do to support? And would you say that it's the finances is really, really that limitation? Or is there other things? Um, I would definitely say that finances does have a little bit of constraint, um, knowing that we need to work within our budget, um, but then not really knowing what that budget is until after the school year start is extremely difficult. Um, you know, how do you, how do you adjust mid, mid year, um, you know, your planning that you put forth in the springtime. Um, so it's, it's very, it's a shell game sometimes. Um, and, and very delicate to maneuver. Thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Kim regarding the Mount Pleasant Community Education programs that we have? Kim, thank you. And th again, thank you, your You're team, welcome. especially Pat Hyman for getting recognized for that state recognition is amazing. So that's great to shout out. So. Yes. Um, thank you for um, sharing it with you. Thank you for, for the opportunity, Tim. So the next item on the agenda for this evening is Kim uh, uh, again, but this is uh, talking about the Way, Oasis Way program, and I think Jamie is going to be joining you or folks. Yeah. And Rich is there. Hi, Rich. And Holly. Hey. So yeah. Thank you guys for the program. Yep, I will go ahead and introduce um, to begin. So I, like I mentioned earlier in my presentation, our Way Alternative High School and Middle School programs are housed at the Oasis building. Um, so tonight I am very uh, proud to present Holly Platch is with us and Rich Clem. Um, Tim, you mentioned and Jamie Cartier and unfortunately due to illness, Jamie is not able to um, be with us this evening, which I'm really sad about because we have seen some um, through through the pandemic. Um, we've seen some, if I can say, nice changes or some some opportunities. Maybe I'll say um, for for students to come in. So knowing that we needed to socially distant, um, Jamie and I worked together in July and August to kind of think about how we were going to operate this year. Um, and so we decided to um, not offer in-person lab on Fridays, which in the past we only offered until noon uh, in-person lab opportunities on Friday, um, because we wanted to offer two to two and a half hour segments of time throughout the day, four days of week. Um, in doing so, we knew we needed to have time in between those, lab opportunities to clean the lab and make sure that it was safe um, and clean before the next group of students. So what we have worked out is three different opportunities throughout the day for individuals to participate in face, in person, at the lab, um, at the high school lab, and, and then we uh, um, have offered an evening opportunity. So something that kind of was unexpected um, is that that we've seen an increase in the number of individuals coming to lab um, by being able to offer those different times. Um, so we have a 10 o'clock until um, 1.30, and then we have a two o'clock to 4.30, and then we have a five to seven. Um, and so in, in total, we see 40 individuals coming to lab pretty consistently four days a week. Um, it, in previous years, that number has been more about um, 25 to maybe 30. So we feel that by uh, providing later opportunities in the day, we're able to meet the needs of more 
students wanting to come in and participate. Um, our middle school opportunity, lab opportunities are, are similar. We're, we're offering um, blocks of time um, so that we allow staff uh, time to clean the space um, before the next group of students come in. So like I said, um, tonight I will have Holly highlight our, our lab engagements and online engagements and credits earned like we have provided the board in previous years. Um, I think Rich wants to address the board first um, in, in, in sharing his gratitude um, for this partnership. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rich Clem and then Holly Plotch. Well, thank you, Kim. I guess the first thing I'd like to, to do is thank you for all of your support on site. It's been a very unique and challenging time um, with a lot of rewards as well, so thank you. Um, really, the three things I'd like to, to convey, and Kim already alluded to this, is how thankful we are for this partnership. It's been, um, it's been very rewarding. I think it's been very successful, and um, our staff enjoy working with, with the district. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is you really have some very resilient students. The, the kids and their parents are remarkable um, with, with the changes and the things that we've implemented and, and tried to reach out to them. They've responded, let us know what works, what they need, and they really have shown how important their education is to them. So there's a lot to be proud of. You've got some great kids. And the last thing before um, Holly uh, runs through these uh, few slides that we have is how um, couldn't be prouder of the staff that we have. Um, they've, they've really stepped up as well in a challenging time and been there for the kids. Um, second to none, I'm just really proud of all of them. So thank you for um, having us uh, with the board meeting tonight. <clears throat> we're, we're very glad to be here. And with that, I will turn things over to Holly. So thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, and again, I echo what um, Kim and Rich have said. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, I think that um, some really great things have still been coming um, out of the way program, despite all the challenges and changes um, that we're seeing uh, across our society right now. Um, so I just want to start um, by highlighting some things for the summer. Um, I think it's always important to, to remember that our program runs um, all year. So um, all of our, all of the services and supports that were in place from the spring um, continued throughout the summer. Um, and we find that this often helps students either get a little bit ahead if they've fallen a little bit behind, um, but then also, um, you know, just keep students in the rhythm of the school year. Um, and, uh, you know, the, like I said, all of the, the things that were in place from the spring, um, they could utilize. Um, uh, as Kim mentioned, the lab space was revamped to accommodate um, the COVID precautionary measures and guidelines. Um, and, you know, I think they've done a really good job in the space of um, it doesn't feel too sterile. It still feels like an environment that um, our kids want to come. And I think that that's something that um, the staff and, and Kim's leadership should be uh, very, very proud of. Um, we also took time to survey students and families um, in order to create a balanced schedule for all students. Um, the scheduled lab times and then also a virtual option, I think that that has accommodated student needs and family needs very well. Um, then moving into fall, um, we currently have a total of 116 students enrolled. Um, that includes 97 high school students and 19 middle school students. There's currently a wait list of six students. Um, so I think that um, there is still much interest in, in the program. Um, I know the staff still fields a lot of calls and inquiries on a daily basis. Um, just to go over a little bit of staffing roles, um, Jamie Cartier as the team leader director. Um, Amy Van Meter is, a, is our lab mentor for high school. Um, we have recently hired a new middle school team leader and lab expert and her name is Tara Tanner. And she's doing a really great job um, getting uh, middle schoolers um, all up and going this, this school year. Um, she just jumped right in. Um, Leilani Richardson is a new lab mentor for middle school. Um, and then we're also doing some cross training with our lab mentors so that they can work both high school and middle school classrooms. Um, Sarah McGill is um, our lab technician and administrative assistant. 
And then um, myself, Holly Plotch, works um, with the program as a regional team leader. Rich Clem is our executive director. And then we also have seven mentors checking in with students regularly. Um, uh, some more um, fall highlights, um, graduates. Um, we're always looking um, for those students that are gonna cross that finish line. And we have those um, throughout the year consistently. Um, so we've already had our first graduate for the 2020-21 school year. Um, we have eight students on track to graduate by the end of December. And then there's 15 on pace to graduate by the end of the school year. Um, Jamie has been doing a lot to kind of um, really, um, help juniors. Um, we had a large junior class um, and, and, and into seniors. Um, so we're really being intentional about our efforts with those students who are, are very close to graduation and, and kind of helping them over that, that finish line. Um, I think some points of, of interest that are things that um, we can be very proud of um, is that the average numbers of students served per day is, is virtually unchanged from the 1920 school year. Um, so that is with the scheduled lab times um, and then also kind of expanding the times that are offered to accommodate various schedules. Um, I think our, our student population has, has responded to that um, and I think it's proving to be very successful. Um, and we know that our students are more successful when they can come into lab. And so I'm just really proud of the staff for overcoming all of those obstacles and challenges um, to provide that support for students in a very safe way. Um, also, um, the addition of, of Steve Wheeler with the Project AWARE, um, providing various social and emotional supports. Um, he's changed up his offerings a little bit this year by pushing into classrooms for informal support. He also does scheduled sessions. Um, and then college and career initiatives as well. Um, and those are, are proving to be um, very, very um, popular among our students. Um, we also um, are, ex are excited that we have students interested in dual enrollment. We have one student dual enrolled and another student enrolled in a CTE course. Um, and then we're continuing to enhance those parent and community education pieces. Um, this is something that I think is very important. Um, we um, should let the community and our parents, you know, really understand what we do and how we do it. Um, and so that is something that um, Jamie is working with her staff very well on. Um, and I think that it's a vital part of this process. Um, we are also very thrilled to have Aubrey Johnson working with our special education um, services this year. Um, I think that um, she's a great addition and she's just really um, providing some great services for our students. So we, we are very thankful for that. Um, finally, um, this is our intervention data, and um, I provided a couple of different snapshots of this. Um, so this is what we usually um, offer here on this first slide um, between um, the time, you know, time period to time period throughout the year. Um, the data is good. Um, the students are are responding to our, you know, um, you know whatever schedule they're keeping. They're still earning credit. I'm very happy to see that. Um, but then we also did a comparison from year to year. Um, and I think that that is um, something to be very proud of as well, um, because things are, things look very good. And, um, you know, our students are very much overcoming any challenges that they might have. Um, of course, the lab attended hours are a little bit less, um, partially because lab wasn't open as much um, as it was in the past year, um, but credit earned, students are still logging in and they're still submitting projects. So I think that that's, um, that tells a lot about the resiliency of our students, like Rich said, and then also um, the hard work on our staff's behalf. Um, so I just am very proud of that, I'm very proud of our staff and our students. And with that, um, I, that's all I have to present to you. So I would um, welcome any questions that you might have. Hi, Holly. I uh, remember, a, so a couple of board meetings, we talked with the high school principal and because of the closure of the uh, high school, we reduced the number of credits necessary for our graduates to finish by just, I think it was um, the equivalent of five classes, if my memory is right. Is that the same case for our OSIS students? Did that apply to you guys as well? Or is that two different pool of students? So it's, it's technically two different things. Um, however, our students um, do have to earn less credits. Um, they earn 22 and a half credits to receive their high school diploma. Um, and basically the difference is in that general elective credit. 
Um, so um, we did not reduce any credits needed for graduation. Um, however, our um, online experts have been um, focusing on on the essential skills um, as far as grading. Um, so you know we're we're focusing on making sure students are getting the fundamentals, um, but also taking into consideration all of the the things that are challenging to students right now on top of everything else that they they face. Right, and so you couldn't lower it is what I'm understanding um, because of the state's level. Uh, and so we were still able to, or you were still able to to find ways to provide the services so that despite the fact that, you know, the close down and such, they could still reach these goals. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Tim, you are muted. <laughs> Tim, you're still muted. There thank you, go. you. Yep. I do it once in a while. As Holly, I want to thank you and your team for accommodating so well to this COVID and adapting like you guys have to support a population that often gets kind of not supported well when things start to fall apart. So thank you for stacking up and helping them. And it's fascinating to see how well they raised to the occasion, um, the students and the staff there. So thank you to everyone. And please for the board, take that back and make sure you share that with them. Well, thank you. And I just want to again, um, you know, give the credit to the, the on-site staff there and to Kim and her leadership, um, you know, just rising to the challenge in every way possible. So it's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank Next you for is still with Ms. Kim. And we will be going on to McKinney Vento. Um, Kim, back to you. Okay, thank you so much. I promise I will be brief. Um, this is a presentation I normally share with the board in August, and August was very, very busy and hectic. Um, so I'm glad to be able to have the opportunity today, November 2nd of 2020. Um, November actually is Homeless Awareness Month. So I thought it was very applicable that I um, be able to share a summary from last year's McKinney Vento numbers and then kind of give a brief on um, what we're seeing so far this year. Um, but also for that, I, I always find this opportunity um, to be an educational opportunity, not only for our board. Um, we have uh, a few new board members who may have not heard um, this information before, but also for our community to be aware of our vulnerable population, our homeless um, families and students that are, are living among our, our community. Um, the first few slides uh, are not my own. Um, I, we did have our first regional McKinney-Vento meeting. Um, we, we are in a five county consortium. Um, Esther Combs is our regional McKinney-Vento grant coordinator. Uh, she was in a horrendous uh, automobile accident almost two and a half years ago. And so um, just last month was our first opportunity to meet collaboratively as a region um, since Esther's return. Um, so these first few slides came from our regional meeting that I, I really felt um, um, important to share tonight because I do feel like this paints a picture um, that I probably could not have done so well. So I'm just gonna read verbatim. Um, often families who are homeless have experienced ongoing trauma in the form of childhood abuse and domestic and community violence, as well as the traumas associated with poverty and the loss of home, safety, and sense of security. These experiences can significantly impact how children and adults think, feel, behave, relate to others, and cope. 
a constant barrage of stressful and traumatic experiences can have profound effects on a child's development and his or her ability to learn, ultimately affecting success in life. Having the opportunity to serve in this position, um, gosh, I think this is going on my eighth year. Um, I have been witness to that um, years and years in a row. So the next few thought slides just help us understand that homelessness, homelessness is an economic issue. It is not a character flaw. Often we have perception of someone um, in a homeless, homeless situation as having fault. Um, it's their fault. It's by choice they're in the situation that they're in. And let me say that that is um, further from the truth in, in my experiences in working with um, individuals in homeless situation. More, moreover, it's lack of affordable housing, um, foreclosures and evictions that face our, our, our individuals, um, poor credit history, uh, economic insecurity, unemployment, health issues. Often I hear about um, the one situation that put my, my family at risk. You know, I had a, an operation, I could not work, I could not, you know, it just kind of snowballs and eventually the family is homeless. Um, of course, domestic violence, abuse or neglect situations. All are factors that lead to homeless, homelessness um, among our community. This slide I thought was extremely powerful. Um, this is uh, information that comes from National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, this is Michigan information from 2019. Um, so you can see what the minimum wage is. You can see what it costs for two bedroom housing. Um, for you to be able to afford a two bedroom rental, um, you need to be earning about $17.25 an hour. For an individual to be able to afford a two bedroom house on minimum wage, he or she has to work uh, an average of 73 hours a week or have 1.8 full-time jobs. So it's staggering, um, this information, and no doubt um, you can understand how somebody, somebody can get in a situation um, where they're not able to afford um, stable and, and adequate housing on their own. Next, I'll go into the McKinney-Vento Act. Um, for those of you who are not aware, the McKinney-Vento Act is a federal law. Um, that does require school districts and public school academies across the country to have a staff member like myself that reaches out to individuals, uh, families, and youth who may be experiencing homelessness. Um, so in our district, we have an identification process, um, a housing situation survey uh, that or questions that um, either is a separate sheet that goes in with our enrollment packet or are a few questions on our enrollment application um, that throws up a flag um, if an individual um, identifies one way or the other. Um, so those, those situations come to me um, and then it's my job to reach out to individuals or families um, and then determine whether or not their situation fits under the umbrella of homelessness um, under the McKinney-Vento. Uh, my first couple years doing this, this role, it was very confusing to me how somebody could qualify as homeless under McKinney-Vento, but when I reached out to 8CAP or MISHTA, that individual didn't qualify. Um, so it's important to know that there's, there's different laws, um, different federal laws that have different criteria or standards that um, qualify an individual um, as, as being homeless or, or in a transitional situation. Um, so one of those discrepancies is being doubled up or sharing the home or rental of somebody else. Um, and so MISHTA does not identify that as homelessness, which uh, McKinney-Vento does. Um, so the next slide just again 
um, highlights, uh, briefly highlights educational rights for individuals once they have been identified um, under McKinney-Vento. So the, the first and foremost is students can uh, have the right to remain in the school of origin um, where he or she resided before they became homeless or they can be enrolled in the school where they're currently residing. Um, the purpose of McKinney-Vento is to assure that education is stable for individuals. Um, as, as educators, we know that every time a student moves um, schools or classrooms, he or she loses up to six months of learning. And so it's really important that we try to keep students um, within the school of origin at, at all times, um, as long as it's feasible, it's reasonable, and of course, it's in the student's best interest and he or she are safe. Um, students can enroll in the school immediately, even if they don't have the proper documents to enroll. Um, so I can work with families to obtain birth certificates um, and, and we can work through around some of those um, required enrollment documentations if the family does not have them. Students can receive Title I academic services immediately, um, and that is, of course, if, if they're needed. Um, students can also receive free meals, um, and, and that status remains for the entire school year. Um, we're al also able, able to provide um, different supports, such as academic tutoring or um, counseling as, as needed. The next slide just shows, um, kind of highlights who, who may be considered as homeless. Um, and again, as liaisons, we really focus in on individuals who lack fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residents. Um, children and youth who are sharing housing of other persons, and that's mainly due to loss of housing. Um, maybe there was a fire or flooding that we've experienced in the last few years or some other similar economic hardship or domestic violence situation. Um, of course, um, you know, the more uh, obvious situations, children's living in hotels, motels, campers, cars, in shelters, um, transitional housing or public spaces. Um, and, and I have seen several situations of substandard housing. Migratory children and youth also qualify under McKinney-Vento. I do want to mention transitional housing um, a little bit more because often individuals don't see themselves as living in transitional housing, um, but that means if uh, an individual is receiving um, a housing voucher, a Section 8 voucher, Mish Mishta voucher, HUD voucher, um, and so if they didn't have that voucher, that individual may or may not be able to um, provide rent um, and, and have that fixed, adequate, and regular housing. Um, some potential warning signs. Um, so every year our staff and student and teachers, uh, administrators go through safe schools training. Um, part of McKinney-Vento legislation requires us to receive um, adequate training every year in order to help identify um, and, and be aware of the signs of an individual who may be homeless. So these are just a few of the um, um, signs that we are trained to look for. Um, and again, our biggest way of identifying students is through our identification on that housing survey. Um, but, but quite often throughout the year, I will hear from teachers um, who have uh, who may have a student that shares certain situations or a parent might reach out to a teacher that they trust um, and so all of those um, Reportings then come to me um, and, and I reach out to the families to get more information and see how I can help um, uh, Connect them with agencies and, and resources in our community Often we see barriers um, for children who are, are homeless. Um, and so again, back to that enrollment, 
Um, and we don't see this uh, happen as often anymore, but I still do hear about circumstances where somebody's been denied enrollment um, because they do not have the proper documentation um, to be able to enroll. Uh, lack of school stability. Um, often we see students um, who are enrolled in our schools who may have been enrolled in two other schools that same school year. Um, so that high mo mobility of, of students in homelessness is very concerning and very much a barrier to life success. Lack of transportation. Um, McKinney Vento, we, we, are, we are able to help out with that. Um, often in rural situations, it does become tricky, um, but the School of Origin, School of Residency, we're required to collaborate and work out um, ways so that we can make sure that school is stable for individuals. Right now, we've got a situation where Shepherd is bringing two um, elementary students to our district in the morning, every morning, and our buses are bringing the students back to their residence in, in the afternoon. Um, it happens to be a, a house that's right there on the border between the two school district lines, um, but that was an amicable transition or transportation agreement um, that, that we were able to work out um, to be able to support those individuals. Um, poor health, uh, often individuals do not have um, proper uh, insurance to be able to seek out um, uh, medical need when needed. Um, so again, McKinney-Vento funds are able to help fill in that gap. Emotional crisis, mental health issues, um, certainly McKinney-Vento funds can be used to help um, provide social, emotional, mental health um, um, supports as well. Our unaccompanied youth, we, we, this past year, and I'll get into our numbers, our summary numbers shortly, um, but our unaccompanied youth are, are individuals who are not residing with a guardian or a parent. Um, and so often I work closely with our high school uh, at-risk counselor, Deb Milkey, um, and the other counselors at the high school so that we're able to identify and provide our students who are navigating life on their own. Um, we connect them with uh, Listening Ear. They have a transitional living program that does provide services um, and, and uh, safe housing for those who qualify um, through their supports. The next slide um, is a uh, summary showing what our homeless numbers have been um, the past several years you will see a significant decrease in our numbers last year um, and, and I'm, I'm not really sure um, why that number is so significantly low other than uh, you know we closed with three months um, two and a half months left of the school year um, and so uh, that's the only logic I can I can see in that decrease in numbers because I know personally it felt like I was very busy providing services and supports um, to individuals all year long. The next slide just shows a breakdown of our age groups of those 94 individuals. Um, it is my job to identify preschool age children as well, or um, so that number nine are, are, represents children who are not school aged. We had 47 students between pre-K and fifth grade. 15 students between sixth and eighth grade and 23 students identified ninth through 12th grade. Um, I apologize, this next slide is slightly wrong. Um, the percentages are correct, but I did not correct the number of youth. So again, unaccompanied youth are individuals who are not living with a parent or guardian. Um, so we did see 17% of our overall um, uh, homeless individuals who are unaccompanied, 83% um, of those were residing with family members or, um, or parents. The next slide shows a um, nighttime residency of our 94 individuals. Again, this is just a, a glance. 
Um, we did help um, provide supports for individuals who are uh, residing temporarily in our uh, domestic violence shelter. Um, uh, we had individuals in hotel or motels. Um, the, our most significant number of homeless individuals are doubled up or living with family or friends. Um, and then our next highest is, are those individuals living in transitional housing, um, mischief vouchers, maybe they're at the shelter, but working um, really close to getting to an apartment. Um, I may label that individual as transitional housing as well. This next slide, I will mention right off the bat that the numbers, if you add them all up, exceed 94. This slide just shows that individuals often are in, um, counted in multiple categories. So a majority of our students, minus our nine non-school age students, are enrolled in general education classes. Um, of those 94, or excuse me, 85, we had five also in alternative education. 24 in special education programs, four in vocational education, educational programs, and like I mentioned, nine of them um, were not school-aged. Taking a closer look at our first three months, um, I was a little surprised to see our number had dipped so low last year, considering the past Previous years, um, we saw a slight increase in our number of um, identified homeless students. So I wanted to take a closer look. So this slide just compares the first three months of last school year in blue, 2019, to this school year in red, 2020. Um, so you'll see in August, um, I only identified one individual as compared to 14 last August. This September was a very busy month with 32 individuals identified um, compared to 22. Um, and then October dipped uh, a little bit in comparison to last year. Um, so again, this was just me trying to problem solve and figure out, um, you know, are we on track to, to see the same number or um, what's going on? The last slide I just wanted to highlight, um, we do have different funding sources that we have to be able to support the numerous and various needs of our individuals. Um, as a Title I school district, we are required by law to set aside federal Title I dollars to provide academic tutoring, mental health, um, medical needs, um, we can help pay for um, additional costs due to uh, any enrollments um, or academic supply needs that an individual has. Um, our regional McKinney-Vento grant that shared with five counties, we are able to provide for temporary transportation costs, um, uh, housing, uh, emergency housing up to a week. Um, usually that's a shared cost um, with Mount Pleasant in our region. Um, and so graduation, uh, caps and gowns, athletic physicals. Um, there's lots of ways that the McKinney-Vento grant can, can provide support. Um, in addition to that, I do write additional grants, community grants, to be able to provide um, supports that are needed right now. Um, I know of lots of resources in our community that I can steer uh, individuals toward, but over the years I've learned that when somebody asks for help, they need that help now. They can't wait to fill out an application or somebody to get back to them within a week or two weeks. They need help now. Um, and so that's why it's been important for, for me to um, seek out other funding sources so that we don't have to wait on other agencies to fill in that gap. Um, we can be that bridge um, while we're waiting for our uh, other agencies in our community to help out. Um, but in the meantime, individuals need help right away. So with that, I think I am to my last slide, um, just with my information. Um, primarily my time is spent this year at Oasis, um, but if somebody were to call Kinney, um, my number is up there as well, along with my email address.
So with that, I just thank the board very much for the opportunity to be able to share this information um, and, and be able to put a face to our homeless person um, liaison for our district, um, for anybody who may know someone um, who may be in need and want me to reach out. So thank, thank you. you Do you have any questions, anyone? Kim, if I, I don't were... have a question, but I would like to just thank Kim for everything she does. I can't, she's been an, an amazing person over the, the years that I've been on the board and I just can't sing her praises enough. She's uh, the right person for that job. Thank you very much, Kim. Are you trying to make me cry, Sheila? I am. <laughs> It is my absolute pleasure and I very feel um, very much honored and um, I, I definitely feel like I'm doing the right thing and, and in um, the right service. So thank you. Kim, for any community members that would want to feel, feel uh, compelled to help, what would they do? How would they, how would they get involved? Um, well, it depends on what their help um, what their help is. So we do have a Students of Promise um, activities account set up through the district. And so if individuals want to help out monetarily, they can provide uh, donations through the e-funds. Um, and, and again, that is Students of Promise. Um, if individuals want to help out with clothing, um, I can't say enough about our uh, Strickler Nonprofit Center, um, Clothing Inc. Um, I don't take my donations anywhere else but there. Um, they've been an extremely wonderful partner um, as I have individuals needing clothing. Um, literally, it's an email uh, with my request and they send me back an, an email telling me when I can pick it up. Um, also, uh, you know, the other, the other service agents in that uh, Strickler building, um, Community Compassion Network, you know, it goes on and on. There's, there's multiple ways people can help out. If they're wanting to help me personally, um, I'm always looking, you know, at different times to do um, some shopping for individuals. So certainly just reach out to me probably would be the best way um, if people want to get involved and help. Thank you. The other thing I noticed, Kim, you ask a lot is um, mattresses. So if people have mattresses. Do you often have that as a, a high priority thing that's hard to get as a mattress? Um, also, just you know, our community does have a very significant housing shortage that can support these families, and so that's another area. If people are interested in a bigger project view, is figuring out better housing situations that we can create for our community would be another great area. But again, Excellent. our students can learn unless they have a, a bed to sleep in that's safe and warm and a home that's stable in some manner because you can't even start to learn when all of those traumas are going on. And so, you know, it's hard for our, the school, rest of the district and to do their good work when students are concerned about where they're sleeping. Um, and I know st of stories and then I've heard of stories from Kim and other people about some of the sad situations that our children in our community live in. Um, we tend to forget about that and overlook it a lot. So um, I appreciate you sharing some of the, rea the realities that we support um, this evening and what we're trying to do. But um, again, if anyone wants to help, contact Kim now. She, I'm sure she'll give you lots of opportunities and ways to connect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. I will be going on the rest of the agenda. So the next item on our policies, these are three policies and they are their first reading. And so do your thing. Okay, good evening. We have policy 5610 and 5611. Both of these policies have to do with due process rights when students may be sub subject to short or long-term suspension or emergency removal, suspension and expulsion. As you know, last month we updated all of the Title IX sexual harassment discrimination policies 
and the updates to policy 5610 and 5611 directly connect to some of that new vocabulary we discussed last week as part of adopting the new Title IX guidance. The main change here is the use of the term preponderance of evidence as the standard that we will use for our investigation and outcomes. In addition, both, both of these policies clarify or add to the district's records retention policy for these situations as not less than three years in, in an electronic or in other confidential format. Policy 7440 is a revised policy that adds one paragraph requiring the police and the fire department to approve any safety locking devices that we might install on our classroom doors for example, um, a, a safety boot that we might use as a protocol during a lockdown drill. So those are the three policies. Those are the, that tonight is just the first reading. And if you would like me to um, research anything or get back with you on anything in more detail, I would be happy to do that. <clears throat> are there any questions regarding the modification sentence to those three policies? Now here, thank you, Linda. Next item for you is the PSC monthly update. Yes, we um we have been trying to um hold shorter PSC meetings in light of um, COVID and not being able to pull our teachers from the building as much as off as much as usual um, for some of that that work. But we did meet last Thursday. We have secondary business and technology finalizing their report. They should be able to present to the board in December, and. World Studies is up for review. We have had some preliminary work to review all of the various um, newly released uh, grade level content expectations for the social studies world. However, um, we, we have heard through the RESD that they are also going to help guide that work and we really want to work closely with anything that Kathy Peasley might help us do as a region. So that is on the docket and um, we want to make sure that we work closely with the Gratia Isabella RESD for that, for that alignment. And then last but not least, a kind of a side project is we want to revisit our best practices document in the DK5 world. Um, that document shares ph philosophical approaches to reading, for example, that we believe in 90 minutes of reading in our DK5 classrooms or 60 minutes of math. We just want to spend some time revisiting that and make sure that um, that guidance is con continues to be what we use in our DK5 classrooms. That's it. Any questions? Thank you, Linda, and Linda, and thank you, PSC. The next item on the agenda is 2021 Board of Education Appointment Description of Responsibilities. Um, and so this is a document that we generated several years ago, all the areas that board members um, have a commitment to either volunteer to sit on a committee or do obligation uh, to appoint another person in the community to sit on a board or group. Um, the beginning of them are primarily where board members sit as representative of the board on these different entities. And then the second part of the document is again where we identify someone um, in the community to sit on those. Um, so. Our liaison roles are things such as the um, um, the parent advisory committee for the GIR ESD, um, the aquatic center. So we just passed the aquatic center, so there will be an appointment there. Um, the ship board of district library board of trustees. We have two that we will we we appoint. Um, uh, the Cultural and Recreation Commission of Isabella County, which is the Maury Center, um, we have a representative on that group, um, Neola. So we have different people that we identify that support us in some of our roles, or we have obligations because of the structures to support. Um, really out of this, the main new one is someone for the CRC coming up in December. Um, there's a process and we'll get a recommendation of people who apply for that position, and then the board makes a determination who to have sit on that. Um, committee. Um, so we also identify administrative people or staff in the community, uh, in the district, to do, do some of this work. For example, um, Deb is the connection often for the um, election coordinating committee that need to support us for elections. Or um, Jen has roles or that we can identify. 
So we make these appointments at the January board of Trust board meeting, which our organizational meeting. And so everyone, please take a look and to see where you may be interested um, in in sitting. Um, uh, we can go through and talk a little bit about who are currently, um, but I think at this time, just take some time and look through it and learn more about what the roles are for these separate committees that we do. Um, and we give everyone a little bit of a heads up. So um, these are not officers, I'm making anyone on the board, and it kind of just describes what the responsibilities are for those people to sit on that. Um, so please review and think about it because we would like people to step up and we would like to identify many of these people, see who's interested prior to our January meeting um, so we can make our January meeting that more effective. And if anyone has any questions regarding any of these specific things and what they do, um, you can talk to me and or Jen who can help fill in um, some of these gaps. Does anyone have any questions regarding our, our upcoming responsibilities and some of the extra things that we do as a board member? So not hearing any, we will now go on to the item of the agenda, which is the citizens request to address the board on any agenda or non-agenda item. Um, and so Jen, I will pass this over to you for management. Thank you, Tim. If we do have any community members that are in attendance this evening and would like to make comment, you'll raise your virtual hand. I will unmute your microphone or give you permission to talk early and then you unmute your microphone. But So again, if anyone on the meeting this evening would like to make comment to the board, you can raise your virtual hand and I will give you permission to talk. So at this point, Tim, no one has raised their hand. We can give it another minute or so. Well, Jen, I'm not seeing anyone at this time. We will go on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Board of Education discussion. Is there anything that any board member would like to bring up for the good of the order? Uh, I do have a, maybe it's more of a question uh, than an item of discussion for now, is that we left the last board meeting um, discussing what we might do about the Wednesday virtual for K through five, thinking of whether um, we would have educators, you know, maybe I think Tim, you, you mentioned maybe one day a month or two days a month or even line up with the rest of the district. Is that an item of discussion that we would have next board meeting when we review the COVID-19 plans um, because at that point we would be starting our second trimester so I was I just wondered when would it be best? So the elementary leadership team is looking at a model where we can look at one Wednesday a month where we would have uh, teacher work time. We have some questions regarding what we would have to do to provide um, virtual education for our students so that those days still count as instructional days. So we're working through that process right now. We did meet with our bargaining teams and I have discussed this with our teachers association president to make sure that we're all on the same page with how we want to move forward. We're also making sure that we have consistent expectations for those virtual days. So it's still very much a work in progress and we can give you an update when we do update on the return to school plan at the next board meeting. Thank you. That's basically what I wanted to know is kind of what the timing of these things were. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working through it. It's just, we're not um, maybe as fast as we'd like to be with it, but we, want to make sure we have a solid plan in place. I would like just to mention that I don't know if anyone has noticed, it's been kind of off the radar, but tomorrow's an election day. 
Um, and so uh, um, if anyone hasn't voted, please vote. Um, also know that tomorrow there is no children in the schools, um, but the educators will be in the schools doing professional development. Um, also, as Jen did a nice job sending out an email that all of the policies of the school district apply to all public schools during this time. Um, and so um, please be aware of and respecting um, those places. And um, we wanna thank our greater community in being a partner and supporting us in better making those polling places a safe place to deliver our, our what we do as Americans. Um, so vote, um, keep wearing your mask and that being everything before the board this evening, I call the evening's meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.